I don't think we can start talking about the question of drugs without talking about various politicians who I think we should uh, uh, do as they say, not as they do, uh, uh, whilst presiding over legislation, really, which criminalises millions of people for doing exactly the same as they do. Uh, and really, it's not the question that they use drugs. It's the complete hypocrisy around the question of drugs that's the problem. Now, uh, virtually all known societies have used drugs uh, of some sort. Most people in contemporary Western so uh, societies use drugs for non-medical reasons, uh, although not everybody recognises that the drug that they use uh, is, a, is a drug. Uh, and whether they're illegal or illegal, uh, and how society responds to people who use drugs, I think is very much a historical and political uh, question, and very little to do with whether or not they're good, bad, soft, hard, dangerous or safe, or any other convenient label that we want to attach to, uh, to them. The fact is that two drugs that cause the most harm uh, in all countries that are completely legal are tobacco and alcohol. Uh, and I think that powerfully illustrates the point, really, that it doesn't matter whether they're good or bad, really. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about the development uh, of drugs, because um, uh, drugs, really, were developed by plants to stop predators. Uh, but human beings develop ways to consume those drugs. So inhaling smoke from tobacco, roasting and drying coffee plants and beans, milking opium poppies, fermenting fruit uh, and grain uh, to make alcohol. Um, not always the most obvious thing to do, but human beings have found that they could open up new realms of pleasurable experience and new ways of coping with the world in which they live in. Uh, and so you can see various things that people used uh, across, uh, across the globe. Um, and we're frequently subjected to moral, moral outrages about drugs and scare stories about how dangerous they are. And yet many of these naturally grown sources have a historical use, both in medicine and recreationally. Uh, just starting with heroin, considered probably the most dangerous of drugs, but the physical damage it does to the body, apart from chronic constipation, is actually quite small. Um, it was called heroin for its heroic subjective effects, and in the 19th and 20th century, was used as a medication for adults and for children. Laudanum was commonly put on dummies and soothers and was con considered to be perfectly uh, uh, normal. Um, until the 1960s, managing heroin addiction was for the addicts to be registered with a doctor and prescribed heroin. Uh, and Margaret Thatcher's doctor and advisor, Dr Clive Foggart, was a heroin addict. Uh, and he forged prescriptions. And he only got a suspended sentence because it was said that his recovery would be, uh, would be endangered uh, uh, if he was put in uh, prison because heroin is freely available in prison. Not the kind of consideration that's given to most heroin addicts, by the way. Um, MDA, uh, MDMA, or ecstasy, originally was a weight loss pill. Uh, that, uh, and then it became used in psycho, uh, psychotherapy. And it was originally called empathy. And then somebody had this great idea of changing the name and calling it ecstasy. And the dance drug became the drug that was used uh, at that time. Uh, cocaine uh, from the coca leaf has been chewed safely for hundreds of years in South America. And it's, to be honest, it's capitalism that has changed something that was used by everybody for altitude si uh, sickness uh, and has been changed and become a very highly profitable uh, commodity. Uh, and the attitude to the rich man's choice of drug is quite different to that, to the, uh, to the poor man's choice of, uh, 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 of drug. In the financial boom in the city of London in the 1980s, cocaine was rife among stockbrokers and dealers. Indeed, they uh, renamed various toilets powder rooms from which they could get uh, God's dandruff because it was readily available to them. And I don't know if people have watched the film The Wolf of Wolf Wall Street. Really, that depicts the carefree sex and drug fueled stockbroker culture uh, in, uh, in America. And when it comes to cannabis, this is our favourite drug outside of alcohol. Um, this, is, um, this, this is the latest story, um, that cannabis was found 2,500 years old in funeral uh, braziers in China, uh, one of the earliest evidence of pot smoking. Um, and it originated, I think, in Asia, 
uh, and has been used as a pain and spasm uh, reliever for thousands of years, probably one of the oldest medicines uh, called Ma in uh, Chinese medicine and in India called, uh, called Bang. Uh, and it has a long uh, history uh, in Indian legends and folklores and Queen Victoria apparently was very fond of it. Um, <laughs> when it comes to LSD and amphetamines, there's lots of things governments would prefer you not to know about what they've done with them. The 72 million amphetamine tablets issued to British, British troops in the Second World War to boost their morale, for example. The fact that Winston Churchill and Anthony Eden both used amphetamines before making important speeches. Uh, the British military also incapacitated Marines with LSD and sent them on uh, manoeuvres. And in hospitals, LSD was quite commonly used in very, very large quantities, much larger than the kind of quantities that people used in the 60s. So, you know, very much part uh, of, uh, very much uh, used, uh, used in the day. Uh, so, um, often amongst the hysteria around drugs, we're told about the evil pushers and drug uh, runners. And again, I think it's worth remembering the history of some of the, particularly heroin and cocaine, really. Uh, take the opium wars. The British fought two wars against China to stop them from banning the opium trade because they had lots of people who were addicted because it was so profitable to the British. Uh, as David Nutt writes in his book, Dr book, book Drugs, with, uh, Drugs Without Artair, uh, when you factor in the opium trade in China and the vast profits made from trading tea, coffee and alcohol, the British Empire was easily the largest drug dealer in the history of the world, um, which I think is right. When you, but it's not, just, uh, it's not just England, it's, uh, it's America as well. When you look at the American war on drugs in which they criminalise people across the, across the globe, actually we need to remember something about them as well. We should remember the CIA's involvement in funding the Contra rebels in Nicaragua. Actually, they did a terrible thing, really. What they did was they dealt tons and tons of cocaine, which was sold uh, to uh, the gangs in Los Angeles, and it was these gangs who introduced crack uh, into the ghettos inside uh, uh, of, of America for the first time in order to fund uh, the America's war against the so-called communists the, the, uh, uh, in uh, Nicaragua. And today, really, I think drugs, we have to place them as being part of the global market. Uh, reports <coughs> estimate the annual value of the global market uh, in drugs trafficking uh, 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 yeah, something like $426 billion uh, between 426 billion and 652 billion uh, US, uh, US dollars. Uh, and the value of the global drugs trade has become so large that it's actually bigger than the gross domestic uh, product of lots and lots of countries. And how integrated it is into the, uh, into the system uh, is shown by this. Uh, Antonio Maria Costa, the executive director of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, claimed that illegal drugs money saved the banking industry from collapse uh, when the stock markets crashed in December 2009. Uh, and he claimed he had seen evidence that this massive amount of money had got back into the system and bailed out uh, many, of the, uh, many of the banks. Costa, of course, declines to tell us which banks and which countries, but nevertheless, uh, we know that he said that this is what happened. And in this country, um, drugs are categorised into three different groups, A, B uh, and C. <coughs> And each drug is uh, designated as controlled under the Misuse of Drug Act uh, of 1971 and is allocated into a class which is supposed to be based on the harm that it's considered that it will do to you. And um, the reality is the status has very, very little to do uh, with how dangerous the drugs are, but very, very much to do with the politics and economic uh, interests. And drugs are a political hot potato in terms of politics because... David Nutt, whose book I've got here, actually, he, was, uh, he wrote the book Drugs Without Hot Air. He was the scientist who was sacked uh, from the Government Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, the ACMD, in 2009 by Alan Johnson uh, after he recommended that cannabis stay as a Class C uh, drug. Uh, in a lecture and pamphlet, he had ranked drugs in terms of their harm, and rightly so, he ranked alcohol as more dangerous uh, than cannabis. Um, um, this, is, this is his slide. Yeah. Um, and uh, the social arm and uh, physical arm, I think, are, are, are contained in that slide. Um, and uh, cannabis, really, 
is the only uh, drug in history to have been downgraded from a Class B to a Class C drug in 2000. And again, the question came to upgrade it. Um, following concerns about stronger forms of the drug becoming available, in particular skunk. Um, and the ACDM looked into the question and concluded that if there was a li link to schizophrenia and smoking cannabis, uh, the link was very weak. Uh, they said, yes, of course there is a risk of developing mental illness, but that risk is much lower than other drugs that are in category uh, B. And the ACDM's message was keep cannabis in class C. And they concluded it was by no means as dangerous as other drugs, and in particular, nowhere near as dangerous as uh, alcohol. And this was really the third time that the AC, uh, the ACDM uh, had been ignored by governments. Uh, magic mushrooms were made a class A drug, which they were opposed to. Uh, the government refused to downgrade at grade ecstasy to class B. And uh, I don't know if people remember cat ban when CAT was um, graded as a class C drug, quite recently actually. Um, and all of these decisions really conflict, conflicted with the scientific evidence. Um, and uh, it's in this context really, I want to talk about some of the moral panics orchestrated over ecstasy, ecstasy and another one over uh, methadrone. Um, to many in the, uh, the media, ecstasy is seen as being a killer. Uh, people may remember the most famous case of Leah Be uh, Betts, who tragically died on her 18th uh, birthday. And most of the deaths to, uh, uh, that were attributed uh, to ecstasy, ecstasy were, by, were young men. And they were young men who died of dehydration and hypothermia, high temperatures, from dancing in badly ventilated clubs without drinking. Uh, Leah Betts died of, uh, I hope I'm going to pronounce this right, uh, hyper hyponatremia, which is drinking too much water. And after her death, warnings were put out to people to say, drink slower, drink small quantities, sip it, uh, and that immediately reduced uh, the number of deaths. But the real problem was ex with ecstasy was not how dangerous it was, actually. It was the ecstasy takers themselves. They didn't tend to drink alcohol. First of all, that puts you up against a powerful lobby. Um, and secondly, because they didn't drink alcohol, the venues wouldn't allow them in, so they looked for other places to uh, have venues. So they looked for warehouses and venues to have raves. And the clampdown on the rave culture and free parties was completely connected to the fears that the Tories had about uh, protests over the road expansion, about the criminal justice bill, about squatters' rights, and about hunt saboteurs. And therefore, uh, under John Major's government, raves were included in the Criminal Justice Bill and outlawed under the Public Order Act of 1994. And the disproportionate coverage of ecstasy was completely and utterly bound up with a story uh, about, that was associated with anti-government uh, protests and a youthful counter-culture. Uh, and that was the, really the total reason why uh, it was uh, banned. And in the journal on uh, psychopharmacology, uh, David Nutt, who I have some admiration for really, responded to the ecstasy scare and he said that horse riding is more dangerous than ecstasy. <laughs> and what he said, and it's quite funny really, because what he says, it creates an affliction called a quasi equine addiction syndrome. And he argues it would be far more practical to ban horse riding and adding actually was, would be much easier to enforce as well. <laughs> so there was a similar moral panic over the illegal high of methadone, uh, or meow meow as it was, was, was called. And there's a massive media campaign which was orchestrated against it with hundreds of deaths that were attributed to it. And they were attributed to it before even the coroner had reported on the reason why people had died. Uh, and it turns out only two people were actually were connected to it, really. One of them was because they'd injected their uh, veins continually uh, with uh, me me methadrone. And this drug was put into a as a Class A drug, from being uh, a legal eye to a Class A drug. Um, I can't go, really, without mentioning alcohol and tobacco. Both legal, both two of the biggest killers. Um, alcohol causes cancer, liver problems, brain disease and is more toxic than ecstasy, cocaine or methadrone. And when David Nutt published his paper on levels of harm, the newspapers ran headlines which said, Professor Nutt says alcohol is worse than drugs. 
Now, A, alcohol is a drug to start off with. And even the language for alcohol actually is different from drugs. You get drunk on alcohol, not high. You get a drink, not a fix. Uh, alcohol, but alcohol is a much, much bigger uh, problem. And just some facts, really. I don't know, people may have seen The Guardian yesterday, actually. There's an article on the front of The Guardian which says that one in ten people in hospital beds in the UK are alcohol dependent. Uh, it tells you something about what's going on, really, in the world, actually, I think. There were 7,327 alcohol-specific deaths uh, in 2017, 40,000 alcohol-related deaths. Um, I don't know whether I've got... I'm not sure what I've got next, actually. Oh, yes, I have got. This is on alcohol. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Um, but, and, and also, uh, violence. It's connected to violence as well. The number of people... 40% uh, of all victims of violence in England and Wales said their attackers were affected by alcohol at the time. Uh, and it's estimated there was 464,000 violent alcohol-related incidents in 2016-17. So, you know, it's a very, very big, big, big problem. Um, the drink industry, really just like the tobacco industry, is one of the most powerful group of pushers. Um, the, uh, uh, the drink industry spends thousands and thousands on advertising, marketing, sponsorship, contests and special promotions. Uh, it has taken steps to protect its public in uh, image. Its key messages are drinking alcohol is normal, uh, the damage caused is only to a small group of deviants, normal non-smoking adults don't exist, and actually, you know, you think about it, if somebody doesn't drink or is in a pub, they're, they're kind of made to feel like they're somehow a bit deviant, aren't they? You know, it's kind of... <laughs> and advertising is not, hard, it's not harmful, they say. It assists consumers to make a choice. Um, very much the same message that was put out by the tobacco industry, actually. And we now, now know that 10% of all deaths worldwide are attributed to tobacco. When it comes down to the question of the illegality of drugs, I think we have to also talk about the way in which it's been used to criminalise communities. And the way in which drugs have been used to criminalise communities probably best seen uh, by the different attitudes to crack uh, and powdered cocaine uh, in the United States. Uh, yeah, in the United States uh, of America. Um, uh, crack, crack is cocaine. It's the same drug except for crack is adulterated with sodium, sodium bicarbonate, which means it goes to your brain quicker. The high is higher. And you come, I think you come down quicker as well. I mean, I'm not an expert on these subjects, but that's what I think. Um, and uh, uh, and, and uh, it's been really used as a scapegoat uh, for poverty, crime, disease, violence, and social dysfunction within the black ghettos in America. Um, uh, on the other hand, powdered cocaine is seen as a symbol of luxury, uh, you know, a symbol of the, of the rich. Um, um, and in the US, there has been no drugs policy criticised more for being racially discriminatory than the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986 to 1988. Uh, and these laws set penalties a hundred times harsher for crack than powdered cocaine. And a report in 1995 found that 90% of those sentenced for cocaine were black, even though the majority of drug users in America are white. Um, a commission was set up, and it suggested that the penalties for crack and powdered cocaine be, be equalised. This was completely rejected. It was rejected by President Cl uh, Clinton. Actually, Barack Obama, who agreed that it was uh, racially discriminatory, uh, only reduced the sentencing disparity from 100 to 1 uh, and 1 to 1 to 101 to 18, um, 18 to 1 in 2007. Professor Karl Hart used the words of Malcolm X to describe what he thought about Barack Obama's actions. He said, if you stick a knife in my back, nine inches, and pull it out six inches, actually there's no healing. No healing takes place. The, pro the progress is healing the wound by taking the knife out. So he has a real go at, uh, at Barack Obama for not really dealing with the subject. And today, blacks represent 80% of those convicted under the federal crack cocaine laws. One third of those arrested for drug law violations are black, although drug use between the races don't differ by race. Uh, black males make up 6% of the population, but 40% of those people in prison incarcerated. 
Uh, one in three black boys born in the US is projected to spend time in prison whilst one in 20 white boys face the same prospect. And actually, I think it's worse than that, really, because if you're young and black and you get stopped by the police, it seems the police think it's all right to shoot to kill as well. So it's pretty atrocious what takes place. And when it comes to the police in this country, I think racism still continues. I mean, 20 years ago, Steve, the Stephen Lawrence inquiry said that stop and search uh, was institutionally racist. Yet black people are still nine times more likely to be stopped and searched for drugs despite using drugs at a lower rate than white people. And that's before we talk about the cat ban, which uh, was introduced in 2014, which is really effectively about criminalising uh, Somali and Yemeni uh, communities. There's no doubt that that's what it's about, because it doesn't reflect any, any of the harm that it does. Now, are drugs a problem? No doubt they are. Um, but this is exacerbated by their illegality. Um, if we need, I think we need to be clear that criminalising users and the war on drugs has not and will not work. Uh, so why should they be legalised or decriminalised? I think the case for decriminalisation of drugs has been most strongly argued in relation to cannabis. Um, although it's illegal today to smoke weed anywhere in Britain, including on your own property, the police forces have in recent years taken a more laid-back attitude uh, so I think this is what this slide is about. <laughs> <laughs> I just like the picture, actually. <laughs> um, and uh, the police force have, in recent years, taken a more laid-back attitude towards it. And I think that's partially because research showing that shows that police spend something like one million hours each year attempting to enforce something that's unenforceable. Uh, and also the decision by British doctors uh, uh, for the right to prescribe cannabis to treat conditions including severe epilepsy and multiple uh, sclerosis. But I have to say that this is not enough, really. We can't rely on the whims of the police who have shown themselves to be completely institutionally racist and are one arm of the state, which means they can at any point in time decide on who they're going to pick out and who they're going to uh, uh, arrest. Now, one of the, quest the questions uh, about drugs are... Um, I think there's a mountain number of people now who are arguing that they should be uh, decriminalised. I said, tell you, the United Nations, the World Health Organisation, have issued a call for drugs to be decriminalised. They call for reviewing and repealing punitive laws that have been proven to have negative health outcomes, uh, to allow drug use or possession of drugs for personal use. Uh, the UN Secretary General Antonio uh, Guterres called for uh, tackling the problem through prevention and treatment uh, and adhering to human rights. Uh, the British Medical Association, the British Medical Journal, the Royal Society of Public Health, the Royal College of Physicians have all made the public health case for reforming our drug laws. Um, across Europe, 14 countries have brought some form of decriminalisation. Uh, models into uh, 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 about and according to a 2009 annual report by the European Monitoring Centre for Drugs and Drug Addiction the Dutch model which allows you to buy it in the, the cafes in Amsterdam um, they, are, they are some of the lowest users of marijuana and cannabis despite the fact that they have a much more liberal policy on it um, and so I, I don't think it's going to mean that everybody suddenly goes mad on uh, all sorts of drugs if you, uh, if you uh, uh, decriminalise it. I think part of the problem of hard drugs as well is that things like heroin are incredibly difficult to withdraw. Once a habit is formed, the withdrawal is so severe that it's difficult to break the cycle, especially if you start uh, started using it because of difficulties in your social circle or your life or you know, uh, whatever's going on. And that's why I believe that we should return to the British model of prescribing heroin, which existed until the 1960s and makes sense. Studies on the effect of prescribing heroin to addicts, as practised in many European countries, has shown a much better rate of success than anything uh, else that's available. Uh, and uh, the, for the long-term users, it means they've been able to establish stable, uh, stable and crime-free uh, lives. Yeah. Uh, and crime-free life. So, um, yeah. So I think that, and, and the other thing is that when they, uh, when they criminalised, when they made it illegal, 
uh, they started to stigmatise the users. They stigmatised the users, they, it led to isolation, it led to ostracisation uh, as heroin moved uh, onto, the, uh, onto the streets. And I think we have to say addiction is an illness and should be treated as such. We all know about the problems of addiction. We see it every day on our streets. Actually, I tell you, if I was on the street, I probably would be an addict as well, because I don't really know how people cope living on the streets. Um, so, uh, and again, I think one of the ways in which they link uh, addicts, addiction to crime is a real, real problem. It prevents addiction from being seen as a, prop, uh, as a disease. Instead of ad ad addicts being, uh, being seen as people who need help, they're condemned as violent and criminal. And the government's emphasis on penal rather than medical approaches has massively increased the dangers. And locking up people uh, doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Because if you're in prison, you're much more likely to take heroin than cannabis. Because heroin goes out your system much, much quicker than cannabis goes out your system. So if you're being drugs tested, you'll be taking heroin. So that, you know, it's just, it makes no sense whatsoever. And also, prison isn't rehab. If you're in prison, it's a hammer blow to you, really. In terms of trying to get a job afterwards, in terms of moving back into the world and having career prospects, and it's a real problem. And if we decriminalised, uh, it would take it off the streets. It would stop uh, the lethal, lethal overdoses, which occur because of the purity of the heroin, uh, suddenly changes. Actually, it would stop the real problem we have with synthetics that have started to come onto the market, fentanyl and things like that in America in particular, where pe people think it is heroin and they take them and it's a much, much higher dosage. It's a, a manufactured op opioid and people don't realise that that's what they're taking and there's been a massive overdose problem, particularly in America. And, and the heroin given is prescript. Uh, if, if you get it, if you deal in heroin, it's cut with all sorts of crap, concrete, malaria tablets, all sorts of, uh, all sorts of stuff. And, and really, importantly, what addicts want, they get, and therefore they no longer need to steal or are not forced into prostitution and all the terrible things that people end up doing uh, because they need to uh, need to get drugs. And the fact that many drugs are illegal has really also prevented. Their, uh, um, their beneficial medical use from being re re revealed. And we've seen this around the, the fight, really, to uh, get medical uh, cannabis for people like uh, Alfie Dingle and Billy Caldwell. And, and it's great that they've managed to uh, get that. But for too long, people have been criminalised. People in pain have been criminalised because they would not allow them to, uh, to get, uh, get the drugs that they, they, they need and, and not allow them to get something that's beneficial for them. So I think that it makes, it's a nonsense really, and we have to really distinguish between occasional leisure use of drugs, between uh, medical use, and between the miserable and dangerous addiction that many people uh, suffer from. And telling the truth about drugs is important. The nonsense about declassifying cannabis, what does that say to people? It says to people that uh, if, they, if you classify this as being really, really dangerous, then maybe heroin's all right to take as well, because actually most people know that it's just not as, as dangerous. So, and I think we need to look to Portugal. In 2001, Portugal decriminalised uh, all drugs. Actually, this sort of has been a health issue, really. And since then, 40 European countries have done that. A number of US states, Uruguay and Canada is the first uh, G7 country to do so. And uh, so I think it's important. It's time the government uh, started to think about what they're doing around this, really. Finally, I think it takes away the power uh, of the pushers. Uh, power and wealth enables the drugs barons in many countries to control the police, to bribe judges and to buy political uh, parties. It, uh, in the UK, vast sums are spent on prosecuting individuals, trying to interrupt the flow uh, of, of drugs in cities, uh, carried along county lines by uh, poor, uh, vulnerable children actually are being used to, to, to do this at the moment. And if we legalise, the money could be instead be uh, used to spend on education, treatment for drug users, and, to, uh, uh, um, and child protection. And the revenue could be diverted uh, from criminal gangs into government coffers. Now, one little warning on this, really. I'm not in favour of having uh, adverts for crack or heroin. And some, of, some people, like the economists, they, that's what they want to happen. They want it to be legalised and to have adverts put up because actually they opposed 
the laws that restricted the tobacco advertising. And they said because this was about um, pandering to people who should know better themselves. They, they, they have a responsibility for themselves and they should uh, do something about it themselves. Yeah. Okay, so our argument is against the criminalisation of the users, against small-town dealers and producers, and the activities of workers in some of those illegal uh, drugs industries. But we do not want the capitalists to be able to exploit and make huge profits out of other people's misery. And actually, some of the people who make a lot of money out of people's misery are actually big pharma, the drugs corporations, uh, who have sold people things like morphine that people have become addicted to. Oxycontin, there's a big thing about Oxycontin in America, which is a morphine-based thing, which they told people was not addictive, and actually loads and loads of people have died as a, as a result of it. Um, however, I want to say, even if we did this, there's no solution under capitalism. It's not the whole solution under capitalism. Um, Legalisation, I think, would improve the situation, um, but, uh, but under capitalism, there's a reason why people take drugs, really. Um, we use drugs to experience pleasure and to relieve suffering for both uh, recreational and medic uh, medicinal purposes. But those things are blurred under capitalism. Um, the, for some, taking drugs makes their life bearable. For many people, work and life is so, so stressful, millions of people find it difficult to wind down without alcohol or a spliff. Um, some of us are old enough to remember the miners' strike of 83-84. I was part of the Women Against Pit Closures uh, camp opposite uh, Grindthorpe, and you could see all night the drug dealers coming in and out, because actually that place had been decimated and the drug dealers uh, had moved in. Um, I don't know if people remember, uh, I started with train spotting actually. Train spotting was about the 1980s recession. It was about how people coped uh, in Glasgow uh, with the, uh, uh, in Edinburgh actually, in Edinburgh with, the, uh, with the, the recession. They survived on drink, drugs and stealing. And contrary to what the government wants to say to us here, the reality is homelessness, the growing dependence on food banks, the impact of universal credits and the lack of uh, prospects for young people uh, forced into insecure and temporary jobs means that we have a growing problem uh, of uh, drugs and, uh, and uh, addiction. And in reality, I think capitalism creates pain. It creates pain and broken dreams. It treats people like things. It creates stress. It creates anxiety. Capitalism is a, a violent, competitive system. It's destructive of self-interest and, uh, and creates grinding boredom in many uh, workplaces. And uh, I think that part of what the, what the system does, really, is takes away our very essence, really. The essence of human beings is their creativity, their ability to labour and to act on their environment and imagine and create uh, brilliant things. But actually, what does capitalism do to us? It makes us do boring jobs, things that seem irrelevant, and it grinds us down. And I think this is what the essence of Marx's alienation is about. And the struggle for socialism is therefore, above all else, about putting meaning into our lives. It's about taking back control uh, of our, ourselves. Um, it is about taking back control of our labour. And under a socialist society, I think there will still be despair. There still will, will be loss of ourselves. Um, but, and of course, you know, people will face loss and emotional traumas. Uh, but in past societies, this has not led to addiction. Um, and, uh, and addiction problems. And without profit and competition, we can have a pharmaceutical industry that, that can be used to meet the human needs instead of looking to make profits. And that means producing sedatives uh, and painkillers and stimulants and hallucinogenics that don't destroy our vital organs, uh, that don't damage our central nervous system. Uh, ultimately, I think workers' power really is about us taking control of our lives and in this situation, I think we'll need a lot less drugs than we take today. Oh, it's me. Right, thank you. Um, there's a lot I could say, but I, I haven't got the time, obviously. Uh, I've been around long enough to know, Maxine, uh, from the late Wilson period up until the, uh, the crazy moral panic which led to the Misuse of Drugs Act. And uh, it's been said, not just, you, you didn't mention that, by police chiefs as well, the worst piece of social legislation in history, because it's led to a crime wave which has never stopped, uh, and addicted 
thousands and thousands. Um, but during that late 60s period, the way it got going was because they were trying to do the prescription method and setting up drug treatment centres. And it was totally, like, like so many attempts, totally under-resourced. And people were going from one place to another and not getting their dosages. And others were getting, you know, double doses and so on. It was starting a trade going. But it was quite minuscule to what happened later. Nevertheless, it did lead into complications. And then the Tories got in, decided to, to, to criminalise it all. And uh, I think they should be lined up against the wall for doing so, quite honestly. <laughs> you know, because what the, the misery they've caused uh, and the moral panic has, has continued ever since, you know. I mean, at one time, when it was, um, the Leo Betts case was prominent, it's quite a while ago now, isn't it? About 10, 20 years, I don't know. Um, the, 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 the fuss that was made about this one isolated case, I mean, it's tragic that she died, but... You know, and then it was said, you can't even talk about it. You can't talk about decriminalising it. You know, you can't discuss it openly. You know, the atmosphere and the hysteria that's been created. Um, and yet, all the authorities who knew about it and what you were talking about, including the police, are saying, for goodness sake, do something about this. You know, it's all out of control. And, of course, it drags in the police. Police lockers of, of drug investigations have been found full of drugs and um, you know that that was going back for a long way you know and it's it's fairly predictable if there's big money in it it becomes capitalist business in its own way okay i think i've said enough <laughs> so okay. there's a woman here in the aisle i should just say um, i'm going to try and keep people to three minutes so that as many people can talk as possible after two minutes i might tap on the table just to let you know Okay. I'm Jane from the York branch. Um, I don't know if you've read a book called Chasing the Scream by Johan Hari, which is a really interesting history of the war on drugs. And one of the things he outlines in there is how the Drug Enforcement Agency of the USA was set up in 1918 or whatever by a person who was um, vehemently racist and his whole methodology was about how to criminalise certain groups of society within the US. For example, the Chinese were blamed for all the opium coming into the country and, and um, depraving people. And black Americans were blamed for other kinds of drugs coming in. And that just gave the um, police force of the FBI in general uh, an excuse to clamp down. And people like Billie Holiday, who was such a wonderful singer, um, died, chained to a hospital bed, um, denied drugs that she needed needed and just treated as an addict and a criminal um, and that a very sort of sad ending to her life and I think the other thing that I just wanted to mention quickly was you know, the fact that the what, when, when you've got hedge fund managers and people snorting cocaine at parties in the city and saying it's a victimless crime, it most certainly isn't. When you look at the, the impact of the drug cartels in Mexico, Colombia, the numbers of people killed in the wars, uh, literally wars, um, between those cartels, the way in which you know, women are abused and expected to act as drug mules, the, the actual degradation of people uh, as a result of the c cocaine trade, which started, I think, as you said, Maxine, from you know the coca leaf and how, it was, how it's chewed in Bolivia amongst Bolivian miners and the tin mines, that's where it comes from. Um, so, you know, there's a whole lot of history there that I think uh, where US policies of militarizing Central America, it all kind of drives towards making sure that the war against drugs is, is the public face, but behind the scenes, there's a lot of profit being made um, on the backs of, of, a, of a drug war. So there's two men at the back, you indicated, I think. Hi there, my name's Kyle from Dundee. Um, I thought that was a really good speech, Maxine. It covered a lot of what, because uh, I'm planning to write a book actually on a similar sort of issue uh, in the future, because um, I've got a lot of ideas um, about it. But there was a few, you touched, I know you, I've no doubt that you would have touched on it if you had more time. Um, and you were absolutely right. And the lady that just mentioned Joanne Harry's book, uh, he, there's actually a TED talk that he does on YouTube as well, worth a watch. I think it's well, probably the best TED talk I've seen apart from Ken Robinson's one on the education system. Now, in that TED talk, he mentions a... There was a study in the 70s by some scientist guy. Now, there was a, there was a rat cage, right? So you've got all these rats in a cage, and in this cage, there's nothing to, for the rats to do. So on one side of the cage, there's water, and then on the other side of the cage, there's water laced with heroin. And in this cage, all the rats pretty much go to the heroin one and then die. So, and then, so this scientist guy thought, 
I can't remember the guy's name. I apologise for that. But this this scientist guy said, right, let's make Rat Park like a, a rat cage where they've got things to do, like like a hamster cage, you know, we've got, I don't know, like shoots and stuff like that. And then and the same thing, none of, and hardly any of the rats went to the one with heroin because they had things to do. They had social bonds. They could do, have fun. They weren't alienated, you know. So that, I think, and that's, that, um, I think that's an important thing for people to understand. Um, so, but another thing that um, I think that you mentioned, which was absolutely correct, but I'll just elaborate on it further, was you said that um, you would save a lot of money by not criminalising people, putting them in jail, ruining their lives, etc., giving them a criminal record so then when they come out of jail they can't get a job and then they, it repeats the process. But it's not just putting that money into medicational things, which is what you said, which I'm not against, but that's not fixing the problem. And what, what would fix the problem is ha people having things to do. So if, instead of maybe investing in medicational things to help people to take drugs, um, invest things in more community centres, um, which are obviously getting cut to the back, to, to, you know, to the bare bone by the Tories and austerity. Uh, places like uh, swimming pools, tennis courts, uh, sports, and, you know, any sort of facilities are getting cut to the bone. And that certainly isn't helping our uh, society. And you're absolutely right, the only way to, to beat to be the problem of this hero, uh, drug problem that a lot of people have, and uh, not just drug problem, uh, uh, any sort of addiction which could cover alcohol, cigarettes, etc. No one seems to ask the reason why people do it. They always they always ask how much do you do, what, but no one actually asks the reason why. And I think society has got to move to understanding that. Um, I'll just I'll just sum up very quickly. There was um, a Scottish uh, psychiatrist called R. D. Lang. I think he was in the 60s or 70s. And he sort of specialised on uh, schizophrenia. He got, um, he got like people. A lot of people didn't like him. A lot of the establishment didn't like him. But he said, maybe it's not the person that's actually sick. It's society that's sick. I think. I think there's a lot of stuff like people can look into stuff like that. So I think there's another person who indicated up here, and then I'm going <coughs> to uh, uh, ask some people over here to speak. Yeah, hi, I'm Kai from uh, Chesterfield Branch. Um, I think in a lot of ways the problem of criminalising uh, drug use and uh, possession as well as small-time dealership also ties into the, the same problem as making abortion illegal. It's restricting, it's, it's about control, control of your own body. If you can't control what's in your own body, what control do you have over yourself? Uh, and that's, yeah. <laughs> Hello, okay. Um, both of my parents were in the police. Um, sadly, yeah, I know. <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> they were also in the army before they went to the police, so it's like, hmm. <laughs> and then they raised a gay socialist, so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sadly, they obviously, they weren't really the best people, to put it very lightly, and when I grew up, I was surrounded by um, their views specifically on people who use drugs, on addicts, and what really struck me, even though I was so young and did really under, I still don't, I still am young and I don't really understand everything about this, but the lack of empathy towards addicts just really shocked me. I grew up very near Brighton and I saw the homelessness there and I assumed that a, like, a large proportion of that was due to drugs and addiction and I'm not sure if it's if it's just the views of the police, which it probably is, or if it's the views of the particular political alignment that they were in, but it's it's it, it seems like addict is synonymous with criminal, which in itself is very very stigmatized. But it, it it amazes me that addict isn't synonymous with a victim or someone who's ill who needs help. And it really raises the question of whose fault, who's who's to blame for all of this? Whose fault is it? Is it the addicts who genuinely need help and aren't being given the help, or is it? the society that perpetuates this this austerity and this sort of climate, I guess, of a, 
a society in which people feel that they need to take <coughs> to you know to take to you such extreme measures or risk their own health to um, escape their reality. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I really like the point about opium in America in the 19th century. And what I like to emphasize is that opium in America was spoke by the white middle class and the white wooden class in their hipster saloons. And, and uh, criminalization of opium became a way to demonize the Chinese immigrant and a way to, to deport him. And, and a similar argument can be made for what happened with the black community in America with the introduction of like heroin. It, it was there to, be, to, to break the back of this growing black militancy around the black powers. And that's why groups like the Nation of Islam still have a lot of respect among the black communities in America today. It's because like in the 1980s, they wiped up, the, they tried to wipe up those crack houses. Now, Another thing, when I was procrastinating uh, at the Welcome Center, which is a medical library, I picked up a book called uh, The Bolsheviks and the Bottle. And I only managed to read one passage. But the only passage that I met, that I read, it said that under the Tsarist regime, the workers were actually getting really drunk at work. <laughs> and when the revolution happened uh, in, the, uh, 19, in the early 1920s, the workers were hardly drinking at work anymore. And that's because they were less alienated from the society. In fact, they weren't alienated at all because they had done a revolution. And in doing a, a revolution, you know, they had power over their lives, over their workplaces, and they didn't feel the need to find an escape via alcohol. So I have to break into people, and not everyone that's indicated is going to get to, get, get to speak, but can, can we take the man here in the aisle next? Hello, comrades. Uh, my name's Dean Ryan. I'm a member of Hackney Socialist Workers' Party, and I work with young offenders. And um, I think a lot of the media is um, focusing on the violence and the knife crime that's happening, and they're associating it with the drug wars. And I think it's true that actually there is. When you think that the, the cocaine industry is worth £300 billion pound a year, it's not surprising that there's so much violence. And drug cartels are cut out, control their profits about resorting to violence, right? And it's funny because actually I'm, I'm, um, I'm quite an old man now, I'm 53, and actually I grew up in, and I was in what was described as a postcode gang when I was young. And the drugs trade has always been really, really exploitative for those at the bottom. But it's even more so now. I work with young people who are in the care system. I work with young people who have been excluded from schools. And you cannot understand why these people have been used for candy lines unless you understand about how capitalism has ruined the education system and actually fueled exclusions, how actually young people in care, care systems now being privatised, and actually a story is at the heart of it. And actually what ha what's happened now is that actually when you look at the, um, when you look at the drugs trade, actually the drugs cartels are more modelled. There's been, an, um, people should read a book called economics, which is a study into the drug, the drug industry, and actually drugs um, um, cartels now are actually modelling themselves on McDonald's and Walmart and some other capitalist firms, and actually the link between capitalism and the drugs trade is one which is actually really, 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 really deeply entwined. And when you talk about stop and search, actually, actually, the, you know, it's ridiculous that in America, that in the States of America, the people who are now the, the cannabis billionaires are the white millionaire stockbrokers who were snorting cocaine, and actually in neighboring, neighboring states, there were young black boys who were being caught with a joint who were bloody serving massive amounts of times. And I think when you look, there's, enough, there's a report called the, uh, by a, a drugs charity called Release, called The Colour of Injustice. And it shows you how actually the laws in this country are nothing about solving crime. They're all about social control and actually controlling communities. And actually what they show is that actually drugs are far more, um, black, young black boys are far more likely to be stopped and searched for drugs and they're given harsher sentences is even though they look actually um, drug use amongst the black population is, is less than it is amongst the white population and I think it's really 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 ironic we were just talking earlier actually what's one of the, the great ironies about about the drugs about the drug the ineptitude of the drug laws in this country is actually that they created a market in legal highs 
which are more dangerous than natural drugs, you know what I mean? And actually, one of you should read Narconomics, because actually, it, part of the reason why legal highs came about is because the they originated in New Zealand, because it's too far to, to ship, cocaine, ship cocaine there. But what it shows you is actually, if drugs were legal, and actually the drug industry was legal, you could actually make sure that you regulated it, that people didn't have to put some of the shit that's in it, and actually you'd be a much, much, much safer way of, of, of doing it. And actually, you know, Michael Goh says he was lucky not to be arrested when he was taking uh, snorting cocaine. Actually, he wasn't lucky because the chart possibilities of being arrested is absolutely zero compared to young black people on, 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 on the streets. And we have to really point out the hypocrisy of the, of the laws in this country. And we also have to say, I think what Cormac has said is right. Actually, drugs and drug use and, uh, is, a, is, a, is a symptom of the alienation that people feel under capitalism. And actually, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, with their neoliberal policies in the 1980s, they were the ones who created the market. Cocaine use and heroin use became much, much more prolific in the 1980s because of austerity and because of, uh, because of neoliberalism. And actually, our battle is to fight against that world. Uh, yeah, my comments on the policing of, uh, of, of drugs, and I feel that uh, it may be shifting to employers rather than the police. Uh, my partner works for a company uh, where they've started to randomly take drug tests. They choose where, when they do it, they choose who they, who they test, and um, it's been agreed by the union that this goes through. Uh, that it means, apart from anything else, I've lost my bloody smoking partner. <laughs> but, but also, uh, she, if she, she can't, it's a real infringement on people's civil liberties, I feel. I, I understand in certain professions that it's important to protect the public i.e. if you're operating public transport and so forth, that you can be tested. But the, this is an office-based firm. And it's coming through in August. And I'm just really concerned that this might be happening um, in, in, other, in other companies. And the policing um, moves to the employers rather than the police. So it's just a concern that I've really got. <laughs> Thanks. Good afternoon, my name is Roberta, I'm from Brazil uh, and I've been working for more than 30 years in this field, drug addiction in Brazil and I would like to, to say a bit about Brazilian policy. So from, 1990, from 1976 during the military regime we had a very tough law to put in prison users and traffickers as the same uh, thing. So people that would be caught on the street having drugs, they would be in prison waiting to be judged. So we only changed this 30 years after, in 2006, during the Lula regime. We tried to, to separate users than, than uh, traffickers, but the police and the, 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 the judicial system in Brazil is, is extremely racist, so you don't see many people related to drug addiction or drug trafficking and drug users in, in prison when they are white. But we have a lot of black people on the on, on pre, in prison because they use drugs. So the law works for the white and middle class and upper class, but it doesn't work for the poor and black people. Uh, but recently, you know that we have a, a right wing regime that started in January, Bolsonaro. So within six months, he changed the law. He, he, he imposed it again, a very tough laws. So there is no more difference between uh, users and traffickers. And uh, there is no policy uh, related to harm reduction because he erased that from the uh, national drug policy in Brazil. Uh, he was uh, supported by the major inter economic interest in Congress because most MPs in Brazil are funded by pharmaceutical companies. They are uh, funded by the security companies, the bullet, how we call it, and also by the Bible. Uh, evangelical uh, uh, MPs, we have a lot of them in Brazil, is a very uh, 
a big uh, uh, group in the Congress, Senate, and and uh, in the House of Commons, and. Uh, in recent time, we are now having again, because of Bolsonaro law, uh, people are going to treatment even though they don't want to be treated. So it, he imposed this within six, six months of, of government. So uh, we have a lot of... Uh, we're going back in many different policies in Brazil, including the drug addiction policy. Thank you. By the, by the aisle. Um, sorry for everyone that I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get in. Um, after that, Maxine's going to come back for about 10 minutes and uh, uh, come back on some of what I've said. Sometimes there's uh, natural highs that are good. I've just heard Toby Robinson has been found guilty. <laughs> I just, I just want to. I'm, I'm also called Dean, and I also work with young young people that are involved in gangs, etc. Um, I just want to emphasise how much our young work class kids get out of being in gangs. And at first, they think it's a lot, right? They think they've got a family. They think they've got people standing next to them that are going to stand by them, etc. Certain certain kids go up through the ranks. They get to the point where they can afford to buy a pair of Nike trainers, etc., etc. But I'm telling you now, I work with the ones that didn't get nowhere. They've come out of prison or their parents are dead, or they've been shot at. I am working with kids that murder and get murdered on a daily basis. I am soaking that up, um, and the, the, the devastation it causes families and that is beyond belief, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. <clears throat> and at the same time, they're cutting all the services, they're telling these kids they're not worth fuck all, they're telling them that they're not going to get anything out of life, and they're telling them that they're the bad people. That's the truth of it, that is the message that's getting out there. But I just want to touch on something else, and that's addiction. Working class people are addicted for very many reasons. They are addicted because they've been abused, or they're isolated, they're lonely, they're bored. There's a million things out there. I work with people that are addicted to almost every drug you can think of. The treatment for them is so much more different than if you're middle class or upper class. That's the thing. You get respite, you get therapy, you get all these clinics that'll help you out. If you're a working class kid and you're addicted to something, it's horrendous. It's hell, and on top of that, you're labelled. And um, I just think that we just have to realise that addiction is not about the individual. It's not about, it's about society in a sense, what's created that addiction. Finally, raves. I remember when raves came out, they were fucking brilliant. Everyone getting together. There was straight black geezers dancing with gay guys in clubs. There was men and women getting treated equally. People were taking the pill. I'm not saying it was this ecstasy heaven, but it was different times. There wasn't fights if you stood and looked at someone, you know what I mean? It was all that stuff. And I just think, um, just a couple more things. I do agree that discriminalisation is the way forward, but I do think it has to be a total legalisation. And that is then we can invest in stuff. I don't know how far we're going to get with that, though. Um, and just one thing. I have to go to lots of meetings in Camden, and uh, a copper come up to me and said, they legalised it, 90% of all the crime in Camden would go overnight. That is really worth thinking about, isn't it? I really want to thank everyone who's contributed to the discussion, and I'm sorry that more people couldn't uh, 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 couldn't speak. But I think it I think it's been a fantastic discussion, and Maxine's got a lot to come back on. So, Maxine, you have ten minutes. Uh, okay, um, I, I want to very much agree with the contribution about racism um, and how it's uh, used, and the stuff about it being used actually it was used to swamp um, the black ghettos to stop them from fighting back. Uh, and during the period of the Black Panthers. Actually, Fred Hampton was fitted up as well as a result of the way in which they uh, demonised all, all people. But also, it has a longer history. Some people have said about... Um, I mean, marijuana was, was... They changed the name to make it sound like Tijuana uh, in Mexico because um, William Randolph Hearst had a, 
hemp industry and he was worried that, uh, sorry, he had a paper industry and he was a pulp industry and he was worried about hemp coming in as a competitor. So he made sure there was all sorts of stories in the media about violent attacks on white women by Mexicans intoxicated with uh, marijuana. So uh, like an early moral panic was, cre was created really. So it's absolutely been used really, the whole question of drugs has been used by politicians to divide and rule people to whip up racism, to make sure they keep their power and control. I absolutely agree with the, but what Dean said about the question of um, the uh, um, uh, knife crime inside of lots of areas at the moment. I mean, I'm from Sheffield and I know there's a big issue of knife crime and I know, I know exactly who's getting involved in it as well. It's young Asian kids who have got no prospects, there's no jobs for them. Um, actually, many of them are people who've been uh, excluded from schools. Um, it, apparently, there's an absolute link. Uh, excluded pupils are 200 more times more likely to receive a knife carrying uh, uh, offence and be stopped for knife carrying. And, you know, so it's definitely, this is uh, what it's about. I want to say something about addiction, really, as well, about, I mean, heroin, you know, the getting off of heroin is a terrible thing, really, because heroin, uh, the way it makes you feel great and takes you up, actually, it does the opposite when you try to come off of it. And, and it doesn't matter how much heroin you take, you'll never, ever feel the same way. It's just a really miserable, terrible uh, addiction that people uh, get, get into. And the physical detox, I mean, people are learning to kick in the habit. That's because it makes you violently shake and it makes your legs twitch and kick around. So, I mean, it's, it's a, t a terrible thing. What was pleasurable is no longer pleasurable for any of the people who are addicted uh, to heroin. And actually, methadone is not the solution either. I mean, it's a vile, horrible, nasty drug that has been given that actually addicts you as well, makes you fat, it's full of sugar it's a vile bloody i think it'd be much much better to prescribe people and i know people who've been uh, heroin addicts all their lives who've lived ordinary lives who've been on a slow uh, prescription uh, 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 dose and that have managed to live their lives and the fact that it's on the streets is a real problem it's cut with all sorts of shit uh, synthetic fentanyl. I mean, you know, I mean, the, op the opium death rate in America is escalating on a massive scale. So it is a real, real problem. Um, I uh, the thing about the police, you know, you can't be responsible for your parents. <laughs> first of all, um, but the police. It's not just the police, it's, it's the police, the state, the politicians have all used it to divide and rule us, to whip up racism, uh, to find somebody who we can blame other than them, because they're the people who are driving addiction forward. They're the pushers, it's capitalism that is the pushers in society. And I want to come back to the point from the lad from Dundee because I watched the video and I just want to say a little bit more about it really. There's a video by uh, Johan Hari um, and his family, uh, there's lots of addiction inside his family which is why he investigated it. But specifically, um, all the things we know about addiction were started by looking at research that was done many years ago. Uh, of rats in a cage with the two bottles and the rats invariably took the heroin and uh, d died. But then Professor Bruce Alexander from Canada came along and he, uh, from Vancouver, and he said, but the cage has nothing in it. Why don't we create rat heaven? Right, lots of sex, lots of food that you want, lots of mates to knock around with, and the rats did not take the heroin. And the, what he said is it's the cage you're in that's yes. the problem. And that's the problem here. It's the cage we're in. Actually, if you're an addict, if your life is a pile of crap, if your life is uh, drudgery, there's nowhere to go, you're very much likely to go back into addiction again, even if you've come through rehab. But actually, if your life is improved, then there is a big change in it, really, in terms of your possibility of not being, uh, not being addicted. So that's why I said earlier on that in the past, people didn't get addicted. I know there are more addictive things around now, but actually, I don't accept addictive personality, all of that kind of stuff that people want to say. I think we have to say it's capitalism that is the problem, the way it divides us, the way it alienates us from our true, uh, true uh, hum humanity. And actually, if we smash capitalism, but one step forward, let's legalise, let's legalise drugs to start, start off with. And I think there is a move forward.